the MIW Disruptive Podcast is sponsored by Mentorch. Mentorch is a social development network for mentorship. Go to mentorch.app to seek knowledge and leave a legacy. Welcome to the Disrupted Podcast by Minority Innovation Weekend. Minority Innovation Weekend is a weekend summit dedicated to aiding minority innovators on set focus startups, exploring emerging technologies, and showcasing tech startups that have a minority founder or co-founder. During each episode, we will discuss innovation, news about tech startups, as well as the startup ecosystem, and interview people of color throughout the startup ecosystem. Welcome to the MIW Disrupted Podcast, hosted by Sir Walter and Jerome. Today, we got a special guest. Yes, indeed, this young man from Grenada. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes I got to put that out there because I love all my Caribbean people. Uh, but yes, he's also the Innovation Director at AARP Innovation Lab. I am talking about Andre. Brzezinski, how are you? I feel great. Now you give me the best intro I've gotten since I was <laughs> 16 years old on the basketball team. <laughs> best intro in a long time. Thank you. That's what we want. We want to make you hype before we get I'm started hyping, here. Hype and ready to go now. <laughs> All right, Andre. Uh, what's, what's the mission and the goal of the AARP Innovation Lab? So yeah, so let me start with AARP first. So AARP is a social mission nonprofit organization, um, one of the largest in the in the country. It has 38 million members, strong, 60,000 volunteers across the country. Um, and what we really strive for, our audience is specifically the 50 plus audience, people who are 50 years and older, and really striving to deliver them the ability to live their life, their best lives as they age. So it's whether it's through advocacy, whether it's through delivering programs, working in the community, um, through our membership, where we have things like discounts, obviously travel, but we also do a host of other things um, across the enterprise. So the Innovation Lab specifically is, think of it as a little enclave within the big AARP, where we've been charged to say, you know what, let's look really far out into the future and see, are there disruptive technologies, solutions, products that we can foster, build, and grow to ultimately bring to our, our membership, our audience, but society at large. We're not building or creating products for our members specifically, because what we think that if we build for our members, broader society, there'll be impacts and opportunities for them as well. So we've actually pivoted quite a bit since we, since our genesis, call it like, I don't know, four or five years ago, where we were building products originally, and we put a few products in market, and we kind of pivoted recently to be more startup centric, where we're focusing really all our energy on building a portfolio of disruptive, creative startups, startup companies. So think of startups that are doing things in health tech, fintech, fun tech, whatever the case is, um, we're looking for you. We're looking for those companies that we can hopefully add a little bit of our flair, a little bit of our um, imprint to help you scale your company and be successful wherever it is you're going. Okay, wow. Nice. Uh, so like, what are some of the benefits of startups collaborating with Innovation Lab? Again, I'm being biased here. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll put that forward as the bias that I believe that we bring to companies who are collaborating with us is we bring a very unique perspective. Um, we believe that we can help you identify if there's an opportunity um, or to even dig even deeper into that opportunity that you may have already identified for taking advantage of the 50 plus market. And you think of people who are 50 plus make up almost $9 trillion of economic power. Um, so think of it, you're a, you're a startup company, you're a small business founder. If you're ignoring that, you're missing out potentially on a large opportunity. I'm not saying that all companies should be focusing on the 50 plus because that's not the truth but there may be opportunities for you to take advantage of certain aspects of it, um, that it, it, it's in your interest to at least explore it, um, first off. So we believe we can help you with that, whether it's through 
our deep understanding of the audience through research. We do a lot of consumer focus groups, market research, inside gathering, helping companies figure out what their message could be, where they should show up with this audience. Um, we also do a lot of things around bringing them on the road with us. Pre-COVID, back when we used to go to conferences, um, we would bring the startups with us because they're a family. We'd bring them on the road with us. So we'd try to highlight how they're showing up across industry. And I think more importantly, as we look to the future, we're building out an ecosystem of commercial and clinical partners in what we call like a sandbox environment. So we believe that if we have startups we're collaborating with, we can have them just jump into these environments and then test their solutions with the commercial partners, figure out what's working, what's not working, and get some real time feedback um, in an environment that we know has been um, set up to replicate what the real world will look like, but also give them and our partners the feedback that they need to take the big investments and next steps that they want. Andrew, you mentioned three sectors, health tech, fun tech, and FinTech. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the fun tech for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> have you uh, worked with any companies or startups that have got into esports for your target demographic or gaming or, or the sort? Your question is really timely. Um, we have not, but the funny thing is, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, probably the start of October, we actually held a, a challenge competition, a pitch competition for gaming because we believe that gaming is an area which you should be targeting the 50 plus. So you can think about esports, absolutely. Um, esports is a place where, yeah, you, there's just tons of 20, 21 year olds, 22 year olds drinking Mountain Dew and they're crushing it, but they're making a lot of money. The reality is though, everyone's not gonna be playing those Call of Duty type first person shooters or those type of clan games um, where you're trying to build clans and storm the fort but there's lots of competitive gamers out there. You think about people who are 50 today, they're people who were playing Atari back in the late 70s, 80s. There are people who are 50 today who started using the internet before anybody else who is playing esports today was born. So I think again, while we're not necessarily saying let's find an esports solution, we appreciate that gaming is something that basically kind of wraps everyone in. People who were putting coins into the arcade machines in the 80s, that's what, 40 years ago, right? 40 years ago, they're 50. So again, gaming is something I think we think is important. That's for the entertainment piece, but more seriously though, the cognitive benefits of gaming, um, the social effects of gaming, um, they're all there and we believe that's something that we definitely need to tap into as we look forward. Yeah, got you. See, when you said 50 plus, you know, it kind of put things in like, like I'm, uh, I'm over 40 right now. <laughs> so it's just so, like, wow, I might be that it, target audience. It gives you context, soon. right? Right, it, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. It's wow. not, I think like, that's the, that's the whole impression people have, right? It's not, it's not people pushing walkers. Right. It's 50 is young. 50 mm -hmm. is young now. You expect to live until as people who are my age right now, you're expecting to live until you're hopefully, if all goes well, 80, 90, 100. So mm -hmm. 50 is middle age, 50 and old anymore. Right, right. So a good question is, so like, what have you found out to be like the biggest needs of the Asian population? Yeah, so the way I'll answer that is, again, split the, split the Asian population up. So let's think of like the 50 year old. Um, one thing we know is a lot of people are going through transitions in life. And so you're 50, you've been in a career for 20, 30 years. You're trying to think through what's the next thing? What, what am I doing next? And what we do know is that people, as they get older, basically once you're 40 plus, age discrimination kicks in. So it's harder to get a job or it's harder to show up next to that 31 year old um, for the same position. There's just this, this bias that people have. Um, when it comes to age. So people who are in their 50s have a different set of needs than people who are 60, who are 70, who are 80. So if we look at the different cohorts, the different segments, um, you could probably find some pretty diverse needs. One of the things that is really interesting for us across the spectrum, whether it's 50 or 70, is social connections. Social connections is really important, especially where we are today with COVID-19. Um, whether it is, again, you're 50, 
you have a family and you're working, but you need to connect with your mom who is three states away, 200 miles away and see how they're doing. Um, whether it is you wanna check back with your grandkids or if you're in a nursing home um, or if you're just alone in your house and you have no interaction with anybody else outside your community, social connections are huge. Another really important thing for people as they age is the whole concept of aging in place. So nursing homes are expensive. Assisted living homes are expensive. Um, you're talking in some cases, $9,000 a month. First off, who can afford that, right? The average person cannot afford that. So most people would prefer to stay in their homes as long as they can. The reality though is a lot of people's homes aren't built to actually have them stay in it as long as they want. You think about stairs, you think about little things like bathrooms, even silly little things you wouldn't even think about like the way it placed, the way in which the microwave is positioned in the kitchen. Can I reach to it? Can I open the cupboard? So aging in place is another huge, huge opportunity area. You think about it from the perspective of building new homes to real estate agents, how they're selling homes. Um, again, the people who are 50 today will become 60, will become 70. So I think that's a, that's a huge trend as we look forward um, with respect to the aging population. Andre, are there any key elements you look for when sourcing uh, startups for the AARP uh, Innovation Lab? Yep. Um, I'll be lying if I didn't say we look at the founder. Founders and their passion are really important. Um, we, we want people who believe in what they're doing and who have a story that they can tell about why they got into it. Um, because ultimately, if you're building something and there's a strong why you built it, those are the ones that connect to people because um, the stickiness is the key thing. You want something that I'm the consumer, you're the consumer, you can connect to why this is an important product. Um, so really, I would say, I'm not going to say this is the number one reason, but founder, the founder and their presence, their passion, um, their track record of success. They don't have to have had four startups before, but just their track record of success wherever they were is really important. Um, after that, there's also then just the, the ingenuity of the idea, the, the strength of the idea, what it is you say you're trying to solve for, um, and what you put forward. I think one of the interesting things is, especially with some of the earlier stage startups, is they have put forward something that they know is not necessarily the final solution, but here's the first step, because it's not perfect but I know there's something here and we're gonna tweak and tweak and evolve and come back. Um, so again, we're looking for people, people and then something. And that's something that truly I think has to be something that is able to either capitalize off of something that exists already or is really trying to push the boundary of things. So like, what's one thing that you see a lot of founders get wrong? Um, thinking they have it, thinking that just, they just, they have it. Um, mm. And I think by that, I mean, you need to get people to respond to your product. Like I wake up every day with ideas. That doesn't mean it's going to be a great product. Right. Ideas are everywhere. Everyone has ideas, right? Um, some of the best founders we have, they have amazing ideas but they're also not afraid to put their ideas out there. And their ideas might fail, but they're willing to learn from those failures and hear what people are saying, listen to what people are saying and come back and tweak it. Um, because again, we're, we all, we're all guilty of this hardheadedness in some state, some stage in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know this is the best idea. I'm gonna put it forward. I get feedback of people saying, oh no, this name is terrible. Or this, this color you chose is awful. Or I would never buy that but you hard headed and you say, you know what? No, no, no. I know this is perfect. Again, only, only very few people are able to tell the market this is what they want. And I can name very few of them. Steve Jobs. Right. <laughs> um, like, again, tell me who, like you have to listen to what people are telling you. Again, you don't have to necessarily take all their feedback, take all, because then you may never actually put something forward, but you need to listen. You need to be able to listen to what people are saying and be able to be reflective 
and I think understand that, hey, I can take this and actually learn from it and apply it back to my product. Hmm. Andre, you're kind of in a unique position as the innovation director. What kind of led up to you uh, supporting AARP Innovation Lab? I don't know, man. My story is really <laughs> crazy. Um, I, I wish I could say this was my dream job. I think it's evolved to become my dream job because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, um, I again, growing up in Grenada, um, studied natural sciences, did physics, chemistry, math, biology, and those things. Um, came to the U.S. and ended up getting a physics degree. Worked at NASA, um, Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland for mm -hmm. a little while and realized, you know what? I want to be an astronomer one day, I can't stay in a lab. So I ended up doing some work supporting National Science Foundation, um, doing grants for college students, helping college students actually apply for federal fo fellowships for their graduate studies. Um, and really enjoyed connecting with young people who were trying to figure out what their passions were um, and communicating the benefits that they could get and the opportunities that existed for them to, pers to pursue their dreams. Um, and then decided to go back to school, end up getting a degree in public policy. And then again, I thought I was going to stay in like the science and space policy arena with this degree. Didn't happen, ended up at Deloitte Consulting doing management consulting. Um, probably the best experience I ever got. Again, it wasn't intended, but it was the best experience in the sense of the diversity of experiences that I was afforded, working for a client in the Air Force, working for a commercial client, doing internal product and um, corporate development, um, and just being empowered to try different things. Um, it was really, really amazing. And it kind of led me to realize, you know, I can pretty much do whatever I want um, as long as you're willing to take a risk and learn. I think the that's, that's what... Um, my time in management consulting taught me it's continuous learning. Always be curious, always try to learn what's happening around you because it doesn't matter if you have a degree in chemistry, physics, an MBA. You look at the founders, some of the most successful people in the world, there's not one picture of who they are. Um, I think what is pretty common with a lot of people who are really successful is their intellectual curiosity mm -hmm. and their drive. Um, I'm not going to argue that I have a huge drive like some of these people, but it was the intellectual curiosity, I think, that I really picked up in management consulting. Um, so always be kind of like, why, why, why? Get to the root cause. Um, and that led me to AARP, the opportunity arise. I saw there was an opening within AARP to do something in the corporate strategy department. I applied for that role. And I just saw AARP as a really cool place for me at my stage in my career, um, where AARP is trying to make sure that it maintains relevancy and continues to be a powerhouse going into the future. And I was like, that's an exciting place to be. You want to be in a place that's trying to reach it towards the future. So end up in strategy and then kind of like stroke of luck, pitch an idea to our senior vice president of innovation at the time. And he was like, okay, yeah, come and do this little work for me on a part-time basis and roll that into a job probably a year later. And so I've been on innovation team for, this is the fourth year, this is the fourth year there. Okay, so I want to go back to something that you said that I, I find that is so so relevant uh, to anybody at any point in their career is the whole continuous learning uh, process that's so important, definitely in engineering, I'm sure, as well as in business as well. But from your take, I, I'm sure like going to classes and stuff is uh, relevant as well. But what are some of the ways in which people can continuously learn and develop as a engineer? get to the where the direction where you're going in terms of your management and management, like what, what's some of the takeaways or points that you can provide to the listeners? Yeah. So classes, yeah, everybody, yeah, classes always want to kind of hone your technical skills, the mm -hmm. more stuff that you can get. Again, book skills are great and there are ways in which you can refine those. I think everybody should take a class or two a year, just again, 10 hours, pick something up, um, whether it's a marketing class, um, like I, I go on to um, some of these websites, um, like a Coursera and type thing, and just look at stuff occasionally. And I might take, again, I have a physics degree, haven't touched physics in 15 years, but I might take a quick calculus class just to get me caught back up again, because again, I'm interested to see how things have changed. Um, the one thing I say to people, 
because and I stand by this because I do this all myself is reading, read, read, read. I don't, I don't care what you read, but read something. Um, and I'm not talking about scrolling your news feed because that's <laughs> that's that, <laughs> that's that's propaganda that's pushed at you, and it's a closed loop. It's a closed loop. Reading outside of that closed loop allows you to experience the world in different places. Um, so I'm a big nonfiction, I'm a, I'm a big fiction reader actually, um, because I think it allows you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else um, very regularly. Fiction books, great, because it's a good way to get learnings from others, but I love nonfiction because it really allows me to get, again, different perspectives. The last thing I'll say about learning and it ties back to the fiction books is you need to speak to people. Right. So I am a heavy introvert. So being on this podcast with you all and putting all my energy out, as soon as we're done, I'm going to the dark room and just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just decompressing when this is done. But you need to talk to people and get different perspectives. Like the whole, at least for us in our innovation work, um, and it's the same thing for engineering. Mm -hmm. It is empathy. You have to understand the needs of the end user. And unless you can either walk in their shoes, kind of talk to them, understand what their pain points are, you're not going to be able to deliver a strong product. So, and I think that's a critical part of learning that we may not necessarily think about regularly. So I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks. I want to uh, talk about FinTech for, for a minute. Um, your target audience, uh, a lot of those people are retiring if they can. Mm -hmm. um, are there technologies to help people practice better spending habits or to maximize their monies or things like that that you're working on? Yeah, it's what you're bringing is like a really, it's critical. And what you mentioned is if they can. Retirement is like a luxury now for many people. It's a luxury. Um, back in the day, oh yeah, you're going to retire. Tell me when you're going to retire and have a party. Um, it's a luxury. People will keep, most people have to work until, until they can't anymore, until they can't get out of bed. Um, I think the unfortunate thing is we have often thought that you can't teach people um, new habits or new tricks at a certain age. That's not true. Um, what I really like are some of these new um, FinTech products that are out here. Um, I wouldn't name drop any of them, but a lot of them are just simple passive savings. They allow you to put, again, it's like, the, it's like the whole roundup concept, right? Like you spend 4.95 on something, put the five cents away somewhere else. Um, some of the ones I've seen are pretty interesting. So people have debt. Older people now are, older people are now carrying student loans because they're taking student loans out for themselves, but also their grandkids. Um, so I've, I actually recently saw a company that is allowing you to do roundup, a roundup type thing and put it directly towards a loan. So it could be a car, car note, could be a student loan. So it's not actually going into a savings account as much as it's helping you pay down debt. Um, another company that I use actually, I really like them. Um, they, they're not rounding up. You, they, you tie them to your bank account and they basically look at your spend. They look at your habits over the course of like two weeks, three weeks, a month. And then they start saying, okay, he won't feel it if I pull this $5 out here. He won't feel it if I take 50 cents here. He won't feel it if I take $100 here because it looks like he just got a little something in the bank account and he doesn't have anything coming up. Oh, he's going to feel it when I take $20 here so I won't touch it. And before you know it, you have $200 saved. The reality is I can't remember the full stats, but I think it's like half the country cannot find $400 if they need it for an emergency. So you think about little things like that. I think the retirement concept is huge. It's a looming problem for most, but even before that, can we get short-term savings? So whatever we can do to help people retirement, fantastic save, put a little something together. But I think some of the more promising opportunities in the near term for people, especially people who are late forties going into the fifties is bolstering up that little short-term savings because stuff happens. That car tire blows, um, kids need a new laptop for school, something happens. So whatever we can do to help them um, and make it as easy as possible. Because one thing we know about people, we will delay, delay, delay 
um, if given the chance. So are there technologies that allow you to passively take it out without me feeling the pain? Those are the ones I think that are most valuable in the fintech space. Gotcha. So let's see. So for people considering a career in innovation policy or technology business strategy, what does the day-to-day -day operation look like for an innovation director? Every day is different. I wish I could tell you what it was. Um, every day is different because I think one thing we pride ourselves on, at least in ARP Innovation Labs, is that we are expected to be the CEOs of all of our ventures. So again, my background is not in marketing, but I'm expected to understand marketing. I'm expected to understand how that email campaign work, um, how this message test work. I'm expected to understand a little bit of user design, like, huh, interesting. I see we changed our color palette to purple. What's the data behind that? It was green last week. Why did we change it to purple? Um, I'm not, I have more than more experience in logistics and supply chain than marketing and user design, but I would never say I was a logistics expert, but I have to understand, okay, it's going to take us seven days to get this landed from China. That adds to our overall delivery time, which we said was going to be 14 days. We have to, however, fill this box with X cubic centimeters of this product by this date plot that whole thing out so the reality is there's no i don't think there's a day-to-day -day discussion as much as it is um rounding out what your functional skill set should look like um i think the most important thing on a day-to-day -day basis though is knowing that you can tap into the expertise of others um for us trust is a big thing i'm not an expert in this but I know who I can talk to and I can trust that they're gonna give me their honest feedback. Um, in some more technical places that I have worked, um, in, I'll just say it out, like when I was, before entering this space and I was more of a technical background, it was very much, you're expected to know this and I'll stay in my lane and you stay in your lane type of thing. Um, there are benefits to that, absolutely. But when you're trying to act really nimbly, really quickly, um, you have to be able to say, okay, I know this much of this and this here, but I got to get more insights. I got to get this person to, t to latch on and I got to trust that this person is going to help me. So that's a long roundabout way of basically saying there's no day to day as much as it is. I can tell you that I have to be aware of everything, but also know who I can tap into. Um, when the time is right to actually execute certain aspects of it. All right, Andre, I have a, a, a prediction. Not a prediction, but I, I want I want what your I want to know what your take is on it. Oh boy! Oh boy! Uh, this, this is in health tech. How long before there is, I guess, robot assistive robots in uh, senior living facilities to help our aging population? How long you know, until? when it comes to norm, yeah. Um, 2018. Oh, 2018. <laughs> oh, it's sorry, it's already happening. <laughs> so I would say, I would say, um, the biggest hurdles are probably all regulatory. The technology is there. It's probably all regulatory, especially because you know health in health in the health space. There's HIPAA. There's all these regulations around it. Rightfully so, they need to be. Um, but the technology is there. Um, whether it's an iPad on a stick that's walking through a nursing facility that allows you to kind of interface back and forth with people two-way, um, to devices that are smart devices that are robots that are dispensing medication when they have to be and telling you what you're taking and making sure you don't take the medication that um, conflicts with something else. Um, those all exist already, and they're actually well in place in, in a lot of long-term care facilities. So we won't have a Rosie from the Jetsons walking around these facilities <laughs> like tomorrow, but robots are well in place in these facilities. I think um, one thing that is interesting is, again, we don't think of it as a robot, but our interactions are kind of like what we thought robots would be 20 years ago. 
which is again, people are talking to using voice control um, for talking to their devices. There are little pets that people keep in their rooms, um, robotic pets that they're talking to. I saw one fine up just today. You stroke it and it helps you take your um, heart rate. So it's a little puppy. You're stroking it and it's giving your actual heart rate reading. So not only are you feeling calm, but it's giving you your heart rate reading. You can talk to it, it responds. Um, there's some really cool things out there um, that I think the question is ultimately which one latches on and are you going to see it mass market? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I think ultimately it's less the gadget and the gizmo and more the what is it solving for. And I know one of the big things, the, the big, big things that people are going to have to solve for are, again, the isolation piece, whether it's a nursing home, it's in your own home, but also one of the big challenges with all these devices is interoperability. So you got a device that's running on some Android platform here. Then you got an Alexa device, voice device over here. Then you got this dog, same dog I'm talking about that who knows what it's running on. Um, are they able to talk to each other? Right now, mm. probably not. Like I can't tell you how many companies I see who are making their own wearable devices. Everyone's making a wearable. Right. But I'll tell you something, the person, the company that's selling the most wearables, I'm wearing them right now. So how are you going to play in a space where there are two or three companies that are crushing the market and you think you can create a new wearable? Is there an interoperable product that you have that can piggyback of what they have or, uh, over what they have already? Hopefully. But there's so many things out there right now to your question of what's going to blow up i don't know who the winner is going to be but i think and i hope that they're going to be able to talk to each other ultimately at the end of the day because if they can't then the consumer is going to be really just in a fragmented world for a long time to come mm, very true very true so if we could pivot a little bit with the uh with pitch fest for vitality that the innovation lab uh, sponsor Mm -hmm. So how does someone start up, how does someone like a start apply to the pitch competition and what are the criteria you use to evaluate the pitches? Yeah. So pre-COVID, we went around the country. So it was a lot, it was all these were in person. So we picked regions throughout the country um, and went into cities and we worked with partners in these cities to identify um companies that they worked with in the past, startups that they worked with in the past, entrepreneurs, but also to promote it in the general area. So that's how the kind of word of mouth kind of spurred. It was very local, hyper-local. Um, in the new world, in the, in the COVID world where everything is virtual, you can, you can be on a national stage. So we're not regional or local anymore. Um, so there's a benefit to that. One of the struggles though is I think there's a lot of noise nationally. So, you're, so before, like when you were in Nashville, we can really hyper-target Nashville entrepreneurs. No, you got to get somebody in Tacoma, Washington, Nashville, Brooklyn, New York. There's a lot of people. So how we do it, we partner with um, a like-minded organization, call it, um, like agency, to say, okay, you guys know your ecosystem. You guys know entrepreneurs in this particular space. Can you do a little PR? Can you get some comms out? Can you promote it? We also promote it as well, but we try to leverage the power of the agency or the group that we work with um, to do it because um, they're the ones who, in theory, know the ecosystem that they exist in. So startups are all welcome to apply and submit through the partners um, who are setting it all up. With respect to how we review it, the pitch competitions, surprisingly enough, are all audience-based um, in terms of win, in terms of the winner. The audience chooses the winner. It's all audience. Um, so we also have sometimes like an ARP team winner, like we select a winner, but more often than not, it's audience who chooses the winner. Um, I'll, I'll make a, a distinction here though. When we have startups that we work with in the long term we're actually not only working with the winners of these pitch competitions. Um, in some cases, you might not have actually won the pitch competition, but we think you have a great opportunity here. You're a great 
founder, you have a great product, and we'll work with you. Um, so there's two things. It's really, we have an opportunity to get people the awareness and opportunity to be in front of people who are from the venture ecosystem and present their ideas. And hopefully they have a springboard into something bigger. Um, but then also, once you participate in our pitch competitions, there's an opportunity that we can actually work with you directly after the fact. When you say uh, work directly after the fact, what do you what do you mean exactly? Yeah, so we would kind of like an accelerator, incubator. We take you in as part of our family. Um, again, if mutually agreed upon, if you guys thought, it's something, I really want to partner with AARP Innovation Lab or something, and we thought, yeah, this is a great solution. We'd work together potentially on, it could be a co-created product. It could be a collaboration. It could be just like some mentoring and advising and coaching where you're saying, okay, I'll give you an example. There's a real, there's a company I really like. They make smart cookware. Um, their target audience is a 26 year old female. Um, funny enough though, they found that basically almost 25% of their sales are coming from people who are 50 plus. Without trying, without trying, 25% of their sales are coming from that population. So what we think we can hopefully do for them is say, okay, let's test out some messaging. Let's test out a new landing page, a new website that you can direct people to. Let's test out a little marketing campaign. Um, again, it's not to say that people is going to increase their sales, but it might, and you never know. So that's kind of what we hope to do with all of the startups that come in through our pitch competitions. It's, again, mentor, advise, coach, co-create, um, but also, again, hopefully bring them along as we kind of go through the industry, because we always want to highlight the companies that we think are really transformative for the industry. So have there been any like startups catering to the COVID-19 pandemic that came across your desk? Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting question because obviously this, what, February happened, boom. Um, so a lot of startups we worked with, they weren't, COVID-19 wasn't a thing. So I think what we saw really quickly, April, May, the startups that we had been working with actively in our cohort, we started to see some of them pivot very quickly into, well, how can we, again, it's not, it's not a negative, but how can we capitalize on opportunity that's in front of us right now? Um, one of them in the example I use, um, it's a two-way yoga service, home practice. Um, so it's, you're always able to see the instructor. Um, and they were doing well, and then COVID hit, and they said, you know what? All these yoga studios are shutting down we could actually pivot a little bit and become the platform where yoga studios come and host their business on top of ours. So it's an interesting pivot. There were several companies like that that we saw those pivots. Um, one of them in, again, one of them in particular, we, we work with them for probably about six months at a time. They have a, a product you put, you put in your mouth and you exhale really heavily and it kind of gives you a diagnostic of where you are. And what they realized was what they were doing, they could actually use that diagnostic and actually say and do COVID testing just like that. Um, so again, COVID didn't exist. Their product just required a little fine tuning, a little twist on it. Um, a lot of companies I think have been forced to rethink really quickly how they do their business because of COVID-19. Um, I think it is early not too early, but I think the end of the year, this time next year, we will be really surprised to see how many companies are born from COVID. Um, I think the, the interesting thing will be to see of those that are born from COVID, are they then able to transition into a hopefully post COVID world? Um, because a lot of the problems that, again, we can say this honestly, a lot of the problems that COVID has highlighted are problems that existed before. It's, it's unequal access to quality healthcare. It's underlying conditions that persist among certain populations. It's quality food access. Um, so there, there are a lot of companies that are trying to address these things and solve for these things. So in a post COVID world, the problems are still gonna be there. So I think those are the ones that I think are going to be really interesting to monitor. Because again, I think there are going to be lots of companies that show up 
let's see how they're built for the long term after the fact. Andrew, you spoke about the uh, your example earlier with the cookware. Um, you now you have these companies like uh, Peloton and Nautilus that make uh, exercise equipment. Uh, is there equipment kind of like um, geared toward the aging population or technology in this yeah. space? So again, full transparency as an avid Peloton user. Um, I have to say that out loud, I guess. Um, again, they have a very certain market or a very certain clear audience. They probably argue that they're for everybody. I don't know if that's true. Um, there are companies that are trying their best to focus on the 50 plus population. And I think those companies are truly powerful. There's one company in particular, um, Mighty Health. They are creating and they've created a platform that is personal training nutrition but it's, it's focused on the 50 plus so again you look at the economic spending power of this cohort of people of these many cohorts within a large cohort um nine trillion dollars again if i'm 50 today i'm going to live until 90. i need the means to help me be fit, vibrant, eat well, and everything else. So yes, there are companies that are doing those things. I think the challenge, and this is something with respect to, this is one of the big things that AARP does again, which is changing the perception, disrupting the perception of what aging is, is you look at a Pelotonic commercial. Most of us don't look like who's in the Peloton commercial. Okay, maybe they wanna be aspirational, maybe. But the reality is people usually connect with who they connect with and who they see themselves in. Um, again, Mighty Health, they do an excellent job of representing the audience that they're targeting. So there's another company we work with, um, Living Book. So they're focused on putting together um, nutritional meals, helping you who may have been diagnosed with a chronic condition um, understand how you can still eat great food, culturally aware food, culturally appropriate food, um, without putting your hands in the air and saying, you know, I can't eat anymore because I have type 2 diabetes. Um, they're using behavioral science and behavioral economics to help you understand and learn how you can kind of craft and curve your journey with respect to your new normal of eating and nutrition. Um, but again, they're focused on a very specific audience and they're representative. They know who they're speaking to. So again, that's a longish answer to kind of come back to the whole original Peloton example of there are companies that are definitely focusing on this audience. Um, I think one of the challenges though is the mass appeal stuff, even though the Peloton is, can be used by my mother who's 65, pushing 70. She's not going to buy one. Even if she had the disposable income, she wouldn't buy it because it's not targeted at somebody like her. Um, so I think it's, it'll be, it's always interesting. And I would, I would kind of say to y'all, keep an eye out on the companies that are marketing to y'all and think about, would you actually buy it or take it up if you were 20 years older or if you were in somebody else's footstep, foot, um, shoes? Um, because there's so many great solutions, but I think accessibility, not only from a dollar's perspective, but accessibility from a perception perspective is really just um, a challenge. So another thing that affects, of course, the aging population is mobility. Yeah. And, and I always think about uh, the commercial as a I saw, you know, the I'm I fall and I, I can't, can't get, get up <laughs> commercial. So <laughs> have there been any like development in technologies to help one to prevent slips, trips, and falls? Yes, there's been a lot. There's been a lot. I can't tell you how many companies I see out there that are again creating their own wearables to help fall detection, to help um alert people when they fall. Like again, the Apple Watch will alert me, will alert my loved one if I fall. Um, but there are companies that are trying to get bef even before that, and they're trying to help you figure out, are you going to fall based on how, you're, how you behave over the past two hours, a day, 
a month, they can hopefully use all that, all that data using machine learning to predict it and then send you an alert. So um, there's a company that we work with, um, Nona Tech, they do continuous monitoring. They have sensors everywhere. Um, there are other companies out there that, again, they're able to pick up on fine details. There's also a company that we work with recently, Zibrio. They create a scale. And I believe their story is they have NASA engineers that, that help them build it. Um, and it's all about balance. They can give you a balance score and help you figure out how to maintain, how to improve your balance score. Um, and you constantly are working at it because falls in particular for people who are older is one of the most expensive, expensive ordeals. I think everybody knows somebody who's fallen, an older person. And it's, it's not only is it painful, obviously, but the recovery time is really, really long and it can be arduous to everybody involved. Um, so yes, you've got all these wearable devices, but I truly think the future is, again, when we look at what the whole premise of aging in place and the future of the home, you're gonna have sensors across your house that are not only videotaping you or making sure the door is locked, but understanding how many times you got up from your bed to go to the bathroom. Did you close the cabinet door? Things that are pointing towards signs of early stages of dementia. Are you getting up with a kind of wobble from the chair that you usually get up from in two seconds, you're taking five seconds? Markers of arthritis or Parkinson's, all kinds of different things. So the, the revolution of sensors, I thought sensor technology would have been booming and we'd have sensors everywhere. Like 10 years ago, I thought sensors were gonna be every single thing. It's coming, especially with 5G. Um, the inevitably of 5G, I think five to 10 years from now, you're gonna see, again, Talk about connected homes, everything is going to be connected. But again, coming back to the interoperability of data and just talking with each other, um, the winners I think will be those that can find ways to use the data and crunch it effectively. And not only just crunch it, but actually give people actionable insights. That's the key. So you just give me data about my sleep pattern or you give me data that, okay, um, I wobbled when I was standing. Give me, give me an insight, give me a tip. Give me something to do with it. I think those are going to be the big winners um, in the very near future. That's interesting. A lot of these uh, solutions require connected sensors. Um, is is the population uh, concerned about cybersecurity and, and data <laughs> protection? <laughs> I know. I know it. It depends, and that's a silly answer, but it really depends. Um, and I think you can look at people's attitudes over time with respect to security, privacy. Again, we're all using Gmail. It's free, but it's not really free. <laughs> um, right. we're, we're all using Facebook. It's free, but it's not free. Um, I think the big question people have to ask themselves ultimately, or will ask themselves ultimately is, um, what, do you, what are you willing to give up um, for certain things? Um, again, I think, if you give me a set of sensors, some cameras, and it's say, you know, there's no cost, it's free, put it in your house. Nah, I'm good. But if you told me, you know what, $30 a month subscription, and we're going to monitor to make sure that we're, we're, you're not going to fall. Or if you fall, we're going to contact your loved one immediately. I'm, 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 I'm able to get down there. I can trust that a little bit more, I think. Um, but you do ask a huge question about the privacy and the security because my trust that the company is going to do the right thing with my data is one thing, but how, how many of us truly spend the time to think about whether the company is actually securing my data or is protected from bad actors somewhere else? Um, I don't think most consumers are spending time thinking about that. I think we, we, we want to close our eyes and trust that it's happening. I just don't want you selling my data. If you tell me you're not going to sell it, I think I'm good. But I, I just don't think the general population is spending that much time thinking about breaches. Um, it's a big thing when it happens, but I just don't think, um, I don't think we do it. I think we move on really relatively quickly. Think about all the Equifresh breaches and the who and who breaches and they give us free credit monitoring and then we move on, right? 
So right. I think I, I think um, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves, especially you're talking about generations. You're talking about people who are 30 today, becoming 40, becoming 50. Um, we all have different attitudes with respect to it. So data security and privacy is something that's not going away. But again, can you give me something in a value in return for the data I'm giving you? Then we can talk, I think, is really where people ultimately settle and land on. Yeah. So, Andre, we definitely covered a lot of ground um, on this, and it was a great conversation, uh, definitely, we had. So, I'm going to give you the opportunity. I know there's probably something that we didn't cover that you wanted to cover. So what is something that you would want to discuss that we didn't actually pick your brain on? <sighs> Let me, I have to make sure I add, I always end any conversation I have when I'm representing AARP with someone's inevitably going to ask, so why is AARP doing this? AARP is for older folks. Why is AARP in this space? And again, I always like to emphasize that we are in the business of making sure people can live their lives as they age. So it doesn't matter if you're 75 or 35. We want to make sure that you can live your best life as you age because we are all connected to someone, some way, some shape or form that is getting older. We are all getting older. And I think what is the future that you want to have as you age? Um, how do you want to live your life as you age? So as AARP, that's kind of where we stand. That's what we're trying to strive for. But Innovation Lab, we're trying to build solutions. We're trying to really tackle some of the hardest problems. With respect to you guys' audience, and especially the, the younger audience who is kind of engineers up and coming, um, what I would say is find a passion. Do whatever it is you want, because you are probably, again, it's like the NBA thing. Everyone wants to be a basketball player. Not everyone's going to make the NBA. You don't limit yourself to say, this is what I have to be. You have a breadth of opportunities. I think one of the biggest things I saw when I was, again, changing careers like three, four times, and I realized it. I think probably later than I would have liked, obviously, was that there's just so much out there I can pursue. So much out there. I think... Unfortunately, many of us aren't exposed to those opportunities at a young enough age, particularly when we're in the higher education um, phase. We're not really exposed to it. Um, but I think just knowing that there are things out there that you can do. You don't have to be um, an MBA from an Ivy League school to start your own business. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a certain pedigree to do this or that. What you have to have at the end of the day is some kind of curiosity and drive. Um, so you have electrical engineers who are founders of multi-million dollar businesses. You don't have to say that this is what I am doing because this is what I studied. Um, and oftentimes, especially when I was working the National Science Foundation with um, engineers and science folks who were pursuing higher education, it was trying to tell them that you can you don't have to only be here because you can spend all day doing nanotechnology research and what you come up with can change the world in this other direction here um, and don't let anybody tell you that this is where you have to be so again that was just me going on a small rant to say that do what you can do what you want to do enjoy yourself um, there's a lot out there besides just being in what they tell us we have to do Right. And you know that that part I'm gonna to listen to every morning <laughs> when I go to work. <laughs> I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, you make me make me sound like my, you make me sound like my mother. Is that, how I Is that how I sounded? No, no, that no, no, I'm serious though. I, I am very serious. I, sometimes you need that uh, motivation in the morning to get you through the day. So uh, that's what right. I say. That's that's it. It. I, so again, it's easy for me to say it. It's always easier to say it than to do it. And it's always easier to hear it. It's better to hear it from somebody else. So we all, we all go through it. So yeah, don't, again, do what you want. Don't let, especially a teacher, a mentor, a legend mentor, somebody tell you this is what you have to do. 
Um, find a passion and be curious. Be always be curious. Andre, this has been a great conversation. What's the best way for people to reach out to you if they want to know more? So let me ask you the question back. So they want to know more about ARP Innovation Labs? <laughs> that's, that's, um, yes, go there. I don't, I don't have, yeah, I don't have a personal website I can send people to, unfortunately. And, I, and my Twitter game is really weak. Um, but Mine yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say people can always reach out to me directly at my ARP email address if they're just curious. Um, we actually have, um, we have internships throughout the year at ARP writ large, but also Innovation Lab. We try to have a handful of in, um, internships as well throughout the year. Um, but then we also have our general um, ARP Innovation Labs um, website and email address is info at arpinnovationlabs.org where you can learn just the whole gamut of what we do as Innovation Lab. You can also um, join to subscribe to our, get our newsletter, kind of be in the know as to where we are going to be again. Imagine when COVID goes away, you can know when we're going to be in your city, what we're going to be doing, who we're going to be talking to. But we also do a lot of um, nuggets of information and, and news and insights that we send around the place. So that's, a, that's probably a really good place I would direct people to, um, to learn more about ARP Innovation Labs. Yeah, definitely. Well, we want to thank you for being the guest and you know, taking some time out of your day uh, to converse with us. We definitely appreciate thank you for it. Having me. Thank you for having me. That wraps up this episode of the Disrupted Podcast by Minority Innovation Weekend. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe. Check us out online at www.minorityinnovationweekend.org and connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn.